Hello and welcome to this special edition of Free Voices. I'm Daniel Wild, Deputy Executive Director of the Institute of Public Affairs, and it's a great privilege to be with Professor Mirko Begaric. Professor Begaric is Dean of the Swinburne University Law School. Uh, Professor Begaric is an internationally renowned expert in punishment and sentencing and, and is one of Australia's leading public intellectuals. Before joining Swinburne University, Professor Begaric was Dean and Head of the Law School at Deakin University from 2003 to 2006 and from 2012 to 2015. Professor Begaric graduated from Monash University and obtained his PhD in 2001. Professor Begaric is the author or co-author of some 30 books and 150 articles which have been published in leading Australian and international journals. He has numerous articles published in the top 3% of law journals around the world. Mirko, uh, great to be with you. Uh, and the key thing and the key reason why you're with us is, of course, you're working with the IPA on our criminal justice oh, yeah. uh, reform work. So I thought to begin with, you could just let our audience and members know a little bit about yourself and your background and what you're doing with the IPA. Thank you for the chat, Dan. Um, I'm currently the Dean of Law at Swinburne Law School. Um, I've been in the role for some time. I've been an academic for about 20 years. Um, don't hold that against me. Um, <laughs> I've also been practicing law for much of that time. Um, in my practice, has been mainly in the area of criminal law. Um, as a result of practicing criminal law, I notice that we actually don't do it that well. Um, a lot of the, the rules and policies that we have are, aren't evidence-based. It's largely instinctive. And so that encouraged me to go and research and to write in criminal law. Um, and hence in about the year 2000, a long time ago, um, I went through and did a PhD in sentencing. Um, since then in the university environment, I've been doing continued research in that space. Um, and then an opportunity came, arose about six months ago with the IPA um, to do some research in that area. Um, but with the, the main focus being to drive pragmatic change mm. to improve the sentencing system throughout the country, to make the community better, also to, to uh, decrease revenue in that space. Um, and the opportunity to go to and drive pragmatic change in that, in that particular area, um, I found very exciting, hence the reason I met the IPA. No, it's great. And we're talking today as we've released a major report of yours looking at Australia's sentencing system and our incarceration challenges. Yep. So for the benefit of our audience, basically one of the big challenges we have in Australia is a very rapidly rising incarceration yep. rate. It's relatively high compared to other comparable nations. This is imposing fairly significant costs yes. uh, without necessarily delivering the kind of benefits to the community in terms of improved safety. Um, can you give us just a headline you know, synopsis of... What are the main problems with our yeah. incarceration system? Yeah, then there's, having too many people, well, having a lot of people in jail isn't necessarily a bad thing. Having a lot of people in jail in circumstances where it damages the community and is futile from the perspective of the main objective of sentencing, which is community protection, is a bad thing. Mm. Um, Australian prison numbers have grown enormously over the past three decades. In fact, they've almost tripled over the past three decades. And there's been no community benefit that's been derived from that. In fact, what's happening now is that we're having the community punishing itself by over-imprisoning people. And that um, punishment to the community arises in two main ways. Uh, the main way is in terms of the cost. Um, we now spend about $130,000 for each person we put in prison. Now, now you think about that, mm. um, just the inefficiency, inefficiency associated with that. You could, it's become so expensive for each prisoner, we could almost assign two police officers to work day and night and just to guard them. Mm. Not only is it $130,000 per prisoner, but the cumulative cost is about $4 billion. Um, we have got now one of the highest incarceration rates in the entire world. You know, that $4 billion means that every $1 in approximately 50 that state governments generate from people is spent on prisons. Mm. Not on education, actually goes to prisons. Now, that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing, except for this really important thing. It doesn't make us safer. The reason it doesn't make us safer is that approximately 42% of the people in our prisons haven't committed offences that cause significant damage to people's lives. Mm. The empirical data clearly shows that the types of offences that most damage people are sexual offences and violent offences. Now, from my perspective and the empirical data and also from the normative calculus, mm -hmm. those people ought to be in jail. Sometimes they ought to be jailed for longer periods of time than we put them in at this point in time. But there's a whole range of other prisoners. There are people such as tax, tax cheats, car thieves, that are put in prison. They're, in fact, overpunished. Mm. Um, we put them in jail not because we're scared of them, but because we're angry at them. Now, yeah. Sentencing needs to be formulated. Sentencing policy needs to be evidence-based. 
that needs to have an empirical foundation and it doesn't in Australia. And that's because of this instinctive approach, we're just getting tough on crime to the point where there's no benefit to, to the community. Yeah, and I think the key point there is if you've committed a violent or sexual offence, you should be in jail and in many cases you should be in jail for a very, very long time, Absolutely. often longer than what you are now. Yeah. But as you say, about 40% are in there for non-violent or non-sexual offences uh, and they might not be a risk to the safety of the community. And the unique role that prisons play is that they incapacitate people, Absolutely. which is why they're critical. Yes. But we're not saying if you've committed fraud or if you've committed other kinds of non-violent offences, you should not be punished. Yes. You should be punished, but yeah. what you argue is you should be punished in a different way. What are the other ways that yeah, people can be punished? Uh, but, uh, before we talk about the sanctions in terms of it ought to be imposed, in terms of the, um, the punishment that should be imposed on people, the overarching principle is this principle of proportionality. We all know it as the punishment should fit the crime. Mm -hmm. In legal terms, what that entails is that the severity or the harshness of the punishment should match the seriousness of the crime. The seriousness of the crime is how much carnage, how much damage that's caused to the victims. So any sentencing policy, front and centre, needs to be principally focused on the victims. How much harm does this particular crime, in general terms, cause to victims? Mm -hmm. What we know from that, from the data, is that many people that are victims of sexual offences and violent offences, sometimes they never recover from that. Yeah. It's not only in terms of their physical wounds, but the psychological damage that, it's, that it's caused them it is enormous. And so those people need to be punished extensively. But the other people, people, the other criminals, people that actually cheat the tax office from money, people that actually steal cars from people, which are nearly always recovered, the harm that's actually caused to those victims is much, much less. And so given that they cause much less suffering to victims, the harshness of the, pun of the punishment that we inflict on them should also be less. Mm. And so the types of sanctions that we can impose on those people depending on what particular offence type, things such as electronic monitoring. That should be used far more than it is currently. We get to curtail their liberty. Mm -hmm. We know where people are. They're not a risk to us during that period of time. In addition to that, we need to actually, for particularly for fraud and for property offenders, we need to work out what victims most want. What victims most want is reparation. Mm -hmm. They want their money back. They want their property back. So what should happen in relation to fraud, fraud offenders, for example, when they go to court, if they're found guilty, there should be an automatic reparation order imposed against the offender in the favour of the victim. Mm -hmm. That reparation order should follow the offender for life. Now, many people argue that would be futile because many criminal offenders don't have money. Well, that might be true, but the average age of most criminal offenders is about age 34. Most of those people actually go out and have a long working life. <coughs> they will derive a large amount of income during that point in time. Mm -hmm. And then that um, reparation order should follow them for life. So for example, um, the first 10% of their income until the reparations pay back goes back to the victim. Mm -hmm. And that should be pursued with the same degrees and vigour, for example, as hex debts are. No one gets away from their hex debts. Criminals shouldn't get away from the reparation order. Mm. So there are far more intelligent, effective ways to deal with these sorts of offenders. Now, fundamentally, these offenders, rather than depleting the revenue, rather than actually punishing society more for their crimes, they should be actually contributing to the welfare of the victims and also to the community. Mm. By actually, once they've paid the reparation order, they should have a tax order imposed upon them as well, which is commensurate with the amount of money that is stolen. So there are far more intelligent, forward-thinking ways to deal with these people in circumstances where they actually don't harm the community. I think the key point you made there is the, the costs. So you mentioned yeah. the essentially the operating costs of the $130,000 per prisoner. It, it, it is enormous. And then you've got the capital yeah. cost of building or expanding and maintaining prisons, which runs into the billions. Absolutely. Um, what I want to ask you about is in the United States yes. over the last one to two decades, yes. we've seen significant gains made in wow. terms of reducing the incarceration rates there yeah. without compromising community safety yes. and improving the fiscal position. Now, we're not talking about places like Portland where yes. they're saying defund the police, quite <laughs> yes. the opposite. We're talking about places like Georgia and Texas Absolutely. where they've enhanced community safety, got yep. more cops on the beat, reduced violent crime and reduced the incarceration rate. Can you help us understand yeah, a bit absolutely. about what um, happened there? The United States went on a massive tough on crime binge, binge in the early 70s when they had the war on drugs. Um, and over the four decades up till about 2007, their incarceration rate increased fourfold. And they became the world's mass incarcerator by an enormous margin. Their imprisonment rate, um, they imprisoned in 2007 about 2.3 million Americans, which yeah. correlated to about 960 people 
per 100,000 adults. And ours is about 214. Ours is about 214. So we, we, we're getting there, but we actually spend a lot more money when, per prisoner when we put them in jail. But the, the imprisonment rate, then something happened in about 2007, it suddenly dawned on people in the US that, hey, this is unaffordable. The, the total incarceration burden in 2007 was $80 billion. We had 14 states in America that were spending more money on prisons than on higher education. Right. And so there was then a deliberate policy to go to, to reduce prison numbers, not because people had empathy for criminals, but they said, hey, this is unaffordable. So what's happened since then, in the last 15 years, incarceration numbers have dropped by, by about a third. The way they've dropped about a third hasn't been uniform from state to state, but the general policy has been, let's make a, let's bifurcate, and let's make a distinction between criminals and real criminals. The real criminals are the ones that scare us. It's the muggers and the rapers, whereas the other people are the ones that annoy us, being the tax dodgers and also the car thieves. And so there's been a systematic endeavour to go to and to reduce the penalties for the non-violent offenders. And that seems to have worked well. And well, it certainly worked well in terms of, until recently, um, crime rates weren't going up. And paradoxically, where it's worked best has been what we know as some of the red states. Yeah. And, it, and also um, in the federal jurisdiction, um, under Donald Trump, from um, under his presidency, the prison numbers in the federal jurisdiction, which is the 10th largest in prison in the world, dropped by 20%. That was the First, first Step Act? Yeah, first... that, was, that was part of the First Step legislation where they went through and actually released pre people from jail retrospectively, um, whose penalties were judged to be too harsh. What's happened since then, though, in the 18 to 20 months under um, Joe Biden's presidency, is that incarceration numbers in the federal jurisdiction have actually gone up 5%. Right. And so that's been a bit of a discourse there. It seems like that, certainly in terms of the um, a lot of the conservative states, when they're making decisions about sentencing, they're really influenced by the factual data, not so much their feelings. Now, in the US recently, there has been a massive increase in the crime rate over the past two to two and a half years, uh, to the point where the increase has been the highest on record. Um, homicides in many cities have gone up more than doubled in, in two years. That seems to, you know, trying to work out why crime increases and decreases is very complex, but the constant pattern seems to be uh, that as, as a result of the defund the police movement, yeah. um, there's been far less police on the streets, far more tolerance towards crime, and far less consequences for committing serious crime. And so there's been a massive surge in crime in the US. I mean, it's been absolutely dramatic. Um, in the recent midterm elections, I think that was the third most key issue mm. to most voters. Yeah. Um, so with, with the US, I think that might have the effect of actually slowing down sentencing reform. Uh, because suddenly these soft on crime policies are starting to lose votes. Um, but the principal reason why crime has gone up isn't because of sentencing practice, it is simply because there's less police on the streets. Yeah. One thing that we do know about the causes of crime, the number one thing that deters people from committing crime is the if they have the perception in their mind that if they do something wrong, they're going to get caught, they don't commit crime. Yeah. And so if you put a policeman on every corner or a policewoman on every corner, that will almost totally stop crime. The way to increase crime is to actually reduce law enforcement mm. and increase the likelihood and, and, and make people think that if they do commit crime, they're not going to get caught. And so that's exactly what's happening in the United States at the moment. Mm. It's an important point because that was sort of the Giuliani thing of, of yep, more cops windows. on the beat, broken yep. windows, yep. which was derided among the elite media, but yep. it works. Yep. And I think the key point here is for criminal justice reform to be successful and for the community to have confidence that it won't compromise their safety, it really needs to be led by the centre-right, which is which is a lesson from the United States. Yes. Um, and I think one of the interesting things you mentioned is that criminals or prospective criminals typically are less concerned with the length of their punishment. Absolutely. But they're more concerned with the probability of being detected. So. Mm -hmm. One thing that you probably can do, and I'm interested in your thoughts on this, is you reduce incarceration through yes. reducing low-risk non-violent offenders going to jail. Yep. You save money from that, and then you can actually reinvest that into more cops on the beat, which will reduce violent crime. Uh, absolutely. And so and so the rough method, methodology or the, or the aim should be to substitute prison officers for police officers. Yeah. And so the way to make the community safer is to actually release people from jail that are no risk to us, while at the same time using those budgetary savings to put more police, and they've got to be police on the streets, not police in their offices. They've got to be police on the streets, a higher police presence. That will 100% guaranteed reduce crime. There's been hundreds of empirical studies done worldwide in terms of the causes and effects of crime, which are complex. But one thing that always reduces crime is the increased presence of police and law enforcement on the streets 
and also other forms of surveillance. That's why, for example, no one commits crime in airports, apart from trying to sneak things in. People know there's cameras. Yeah. They know there's police officers. It is one of the safest places in the world. People can be crimes in circumstances where they think they won't be detected. Yeah. Um, it's a real paradox. There's this theory called marginal general deterrence. And one of the reasons why we've had these ratcheted up of penalties is that judges and lawmakers assume that if we increase penalties, if we, that therefore people will do a cost-benefit analysis and they think, should I commit this crime or should I not do this crime? If I might get 25 years in jail, I won't commit the crime. But if I might only get 10 years in jail, um, well, sorry, if, I, if I'm going to get 25 years, I won't commit it. If I'm only going to get 10 years, I, I might commit it. Yeah. That's wrong. Right. People actually don't engage in that cost-benefit analysis on a two-step process. It's one-step process. Well, and the one step is this. If I commit this crime, am I going to get caught? If the answer is probably yes, they don't do it. If, they, if the answer is no, they might do it. Yeah. And so that's what we have to um, – that's where the policy needs to move towards. So more police on the streets will make us safer, less prison guards. Yeah, and what's interesting about that is it sort of contrasts to an idea that's more promoted on the centre-left, which I think they refer to as justice reinvestment, yes. which is yeah. you reduce incarceration, the money you save you put into programs like education and so forth. My understanding is that there's no evidence that it actually was – works to reduce crime. Yeah. Uh, is that a fair – what's your yeah. understanding of yeah, that? Yeah, Dan, one of the really interesting things about my PhD when I studied 20 years ago, um, I was a real believer in, in prisoner rehabilitation. Um, and that was the main theme and ethos of that. And then, then I did something. I looked at data and I looked at the research. Um, and the research, even in the 50s and 60s, was quite promising in the US. There was a lot of cognitive behavioural mm. drug reduction programs. Um, and then a criminologist, Mar Robert Martison, did the research and – in 1974, he said, mate, you know what? Nothing works. <laughs> Nothing works. And so since then, there's been an enormous amount of money spent um, in rehabilitative programs around the world. And there's no one rehabilitative technique that works for mm. most offenders most of the time. We know three things about rehabilitation. Though. One, the first thing that does rehabilitate people is age. Um, crime is a young person's, in particular, young man's game. 90% mm -hmm. uh, of serious crime worldwide, including in Australia, is done by males. Right. Um, and in addition to that, it's done by young people. 80% um, of people in, in jails, in Australian jails, are uh, under the age of 49. And the peak age and the most common age is between age 30 to 34. One way we can stop people from committing crime is to age them out, but that will take very, very long jail terms. So that's not viable. The other two things that work are, one, education. Um, okay. the, more f the higher formal level standard of education people have, the less likely they are to commit crime. Um, people, the people in prisons in Australia, seventy-eight percent of those haven't completed secondary school. Right. That compares to twenty percent of the rest of the population. One way we can actually reduce crime significantly is for all people, in particular people that might be at risk of committing crime, keep them in education longer. When people get educated, um, they've got more to lose by committing crime. Yep. They develop better judgment. Um, they're better at impulse control. They're just more prudent. Mm. So let's keep people in education long. The other thing that also works is employment. Mm -hmm. um, people that actually commit crime, their unemployment rate is five times higher than the general community. It's staggering. If people are employed, they're productive, they've got a sense of purpose, their self-esteem is increased. Yep. If, if they're not employed, they've got far less to lose and they're much more likely to commit crime. So at the other end, so they're, they're the sort of things, the typical profile of people that commit crime so when you're looking to re rehabilitate people at the other end, one, people that have committed crime or are in jail, while they're in jail, try to get them formal education, not a weekend course, but get them to finish secondary school, VCE, get them into a uni university course, makes a huge thing, and also keep them in work. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to do, not just unpaid menial work, which they do in prisons, yeah. or they're stripping paint off for no amount of money. What we need to do is that people that actually do commit offences Keep them in work. The more the the um, more of those offenders we keep in work, the much less likely it is that they will reoffend. And so, one of the alternative sanctions that we really need to focus on for low risk violent offenders is that we need to keep them gainfully employed. Yeah. Um, so, corrections should almost act as a quasi job um, matching agency. Yeah. And so, people that are low risk offenders that have got some skills, yep. um, particularly given the really low unemployment rate that we have in Australia now, about 3.5%. There's a huge shortage of workers, even in the non-professional areas, and particularly the non-professional areas, such as the building trade, such as labouring, um, in hospitality. There's a whole pool of potential candidates, somewhere between 10 to 14,000 offenders that could actually work in these areas. 
that should be paid work. And what we found, what the empirical data shows, if we get them in, into work, mm -hmm. their recidivism rate drops enormously. And in addition to that, um, surprisingly, many employers are actually happy to employ people that have got criminal records. And, and normally their satisfaction level with them is, is, is enormously high. Um, so they're the only things that really do work with rehabilitation. Age, we can't impact that. Education and employment, that's the one we can really impact in a really short period of time. Mm -hmm. And that's where the greatest imperative is given the labour shortage that we have in Australia now. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. And the, to put a context around the worker shortage, we've got about so 500,000 job vacancies mm -hmm. right now. Uh, there's something like one in four businesses across the country saying they can't get the workers they need or the workers they have can't do the hours they want. And it's across every every single industry yes. is, is facing yeah. this. Um, so you mentioned the number there was about fourteen to 17,000. Yeah. Where yeah. does that, that comes from basically those who are low risk non-violent offenders that are currently yeah, in jail? At the moment, there, yeah. there are about 17,000 people in jails that haven't committed sexual or violent offences. Now, some people that haven't committed sexual or violent offences are ones that commit really serious examples of that. You know, multi-million dollar frauds from individuals, for example, those people need to go to jail. Yeah. Uh, probably for, in some circumstances, less period of time than they are now. But many of those, probably about two-thirds, which is about 10,000 young, healthy, capable Australians could be out there actually reducing the worker shortage and they could be actually earning income, paying tax, as opposed to just depleting our tax. And what you would find, you would find many employers would be receptive to employing them. Num number one, because they need workers, but number two, because most people act quite pragmatically and unemotively when they're making employment and economic decisions. They will look at this person, yes, they've committed a crime, but when they look at the crime, I mean, it's not rape and it's not murder and it's not a serious assault. Yes, they've done the wrong thing, yep. but it is it's it is forgivable. And certainly to a point in time where they're willing to give a person the opportunity to go for them to work for them. And what the empirical data shows that employers that do that, they're overwhelmingly happy with the outcome. And given all those competing policy tensions at this point in time, I mean, that is a clear-cut policy that should be in place, I think, immediately. Yeah, well, it's a win-win scenario. So Absolutely. you get these people who are currently in prison, they go into work, so yeah. they earn an income. Rather than costing taxpayers in jail, they're earning income, so they're paying income tax and other taxes, so they're actually a net benefit to the government. Yeah. If you've got employers that can draw on a, on a pool of talent, which is really important now given our worker shortage. And in most cases, these are people in jail that aren't a identifiable risk to community safety. So we're not losing much in terms of, of that. No, so. no, we're not. In fact, by, by staying in jail, what, what we tend to find is that uh, the, the theory of what we call specific deterrence, that's another legal theory, um, and that says that if people don't learn their lesson the first time, what we need to do, punish them severely next time. And if we punish them severely by, for example, put them in jail, they'll learn the lesson, not reoffend. That doesn't work. The opposite happens. Criminogenic you could, behaviors, they, yeah. So yeah. what happens in prison, they do get crimin criminogenic behaviours. And what we see is that by putting people in prison, it's only a short-term benefit. 45.2% of people that are released from prison, Australian prisons get back to jail within two years. And 57% go back either to jail or, or corrective services. So it's just a short-term stopgap. And so actually putting them in, in jail given, to give us any sense of comfort or safety is a fallacy. Mm. The best that we can do, particularly for these cohort offenders, keep them out, get them in work, and that will reduce their likelihood of reoffending while at the same time having all these um, concrete benefits to them and to the wider community. And just to, I guess, round out our conversation, we've been, as we do with all of our research, uh, communicating it to the public. We've had some media coverage today yes. with the release of this report, and you've also been discussing with policymakers what you believe is the best approach. Um, can you give us just, a, I guess, a brief summary of what, you know, for the policymakers and politicians and interested members of the community that are watching this, what are some of the headline recommendations yeah. you would make for the Australian context and the ways we can move yeah, forward? Yeah, the headline recommendation is I think that criminal justice and criminal sentencing needs to be victim orientated. Mm -hmm. um, it, it also needs needs to ensure that in terms of the punishments and the penalties that we put in place, um, it's got to be something which is affordable to the community and it must be evidence-based. Once we look at it through the lens of those three criteria, what we find is that we should be reducing prison numbers in a way which will enhance community safety, but at the same time also reducing the tax burden to the taxpayer of the amount of money we spend on criminal justice. And we can do that. And the key, key part about this is that um, sentencing is probably the least empirically based uh, institutional system in our entire community. It, it is the one area of society over the past 90 to 100 years that hasn't evolved. You know, look at the huge advances that have happened in, in, in medicine, 
communications, road building. Yeah. Sentencing, we do pretty much the same as we have the last hundred, couple of hundred years. We get an instinct, we get a hunch, we don't like these people, we put them behind big prison walls. Yeah. That needs to change. It needs to be more empirically validated. Now, politicians, um, when it comes to sentencing, normally take a very crude approach. Their view is that tough on crime, while it might not get them any votes, will never reduce votes. Yeah. And so the policy that the IPA is doing at the moment is presented, presented and projected in a way which is not only um, uh, empirically um, and jurisprudentially um, sound, but at the same time will also be a boat catcher for politicians. And the boat catcher is you can make the community safer, mm -hmm. you can actually reduce your revenue spend on criminal justice, um, and at the same time you can provide a whole pool of additional workers out there to the community. Well, Professor uh, Begarak, I think this is a great place to end. So thank you for your, your work and your discussion today. And uh, very much looking forward to having further discussions because I think this is a, an important policy area. Um, I should also mention that the IPA has been doing research on the criminal justice system for seven, about seven years now, and it's great to be able to continue that work with you. So thank you for your work and the discussion great, today. And it's been a pleasure working with the IPA, Dan. Thank you very much.